So today for the scripture we'll be reading Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. So if you want to turn there again, I will be reading it on public. Okay, so it says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him with sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. If it, is dis- if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, and the gods of, or the gods of the Amorites, in which, whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What a beautiful morning. Greetings from East Jackson, Church of Christ there in Jackson, Tennessee. I am thankful to be one of the servants there. I want to say to Josh, thanks for suggesting me to the elders and thank the elders for agreeing to allow me to be here with with you this weekend. I've enjoyed my stay. I'm thankful that Diane can be with me and we could be here to be service to this congregation. I'm going to get right into the lesson. Uh, I am a long-winded preacher, and so I'm going to speak up and I'm going to shut up. I do see the clock. I did a gospel meeting in part of Alabama once, and the young people got me good on that Wednesday night. Uh, There's a big clock on the wall back there. They took the clock down and put a calendar up. (laughs) They said if he can't tell time, maybe he can see when the month has changed. I don't hope to be here all day. I hope to treat you like Liz Taylor did most of her husband. I won't keep you long. Okay. Before we embark on the lesson this morning, turn your Bible to the book of Lamentation. The Lamentation chapter 1. And park your finger there. And I want you to, while you're turning there, I want to say something to you. And I mean this, and I want to say this upon the outset. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it expresses the Lord's desire, and that is he wants a relationship with you. I want each one of you to know that. In spite of me and the limited ability that I have, I hope you won't hold it against the Lord. He wants to have a relationship with you. The Bible says God's will is that all men will be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. If you're in this audience and you have not yet obeyed the gospel, I plead with you. I beg you. That is the condition upon which you must obey and comply with in order to have a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God wants a relationship with you. Now, lamentation. In Lamentation chapter 1, verse 12, Jeremiah writes these words, Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Behold and see if there's any sorrow like my sorrow, which has been brought upon me, which the Lord has inflicted and the day of his fierce anger. This morning, for just a little while, I want to invite you to the subject, transforming a house into a home. As I look at the American society, and I'm so proud to be an American, I'm concerned because when I look at our families in America, I see families that are deteriorating. I see a society that is deteriorating because of the condition of our families. And as I think about what can we do to make America strong again, what can we do to make the church strong again, what can we do to help our society, it starts with the place of residence. As I reminisce in my life, What has blessed me so much is that I grew up in a home. In Houston, Mississippi, a place perhaps you never heard of, 
I spent many summers with my grandmother and granddad. They didn't have much of a place to live in. We could see the chickens and the other critters running up under the house because of the holes in the floor. Terrified about the little string you had to hold to go to the outhouse that was behind the house. It wasn't very much, but it was a home. And there were some values that were given to me by my parents and my grandparents that have stayed with me. And as I think about America, as I think about the church, as I think about my family, one day I'm going to be gone. And my prayer, more so than anything, is that they would give my grandchildren a home. Because that's what's going to make the Lord's church strong again. You see, we are a nation of houses. America doesn't need any more houses. America needs some homes. And I have two objectives in today's lesson. First is to give you a, a description. To give you a, a, con, a status of the condition of the American family. And then I want to spend the the buck of the time, sharing with you five ingredients. If these ingredients are in your family, they will transform that house into a home. Go with me to the book of Jeremiah. Before the book of Lamentation, Jeremiah, a young boy, was summoned by God to go and plead with Judah to come back. And when this young boy went out and observed God's people, you'll understand why he's called the weeping prophet. Look in Jeremiah chapter 2, look at verse 13. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, Jeremiah says, God, after observing your people, they have committed two evils. The first evil is that they have forsaken the Lord thy God. They've turned their back on you, God. They don't want to have a relationship with you, God, anymore. Second, they have hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What's a cistern? It was a well that the Jews would dig and they would catch the rainwater. They would cover it up and in dry seasons, they would go to these cisterns for needed water. But there's just one problem. They all crack. And when they really needed this rainwater, what they put their trust in is going to fail them. Jeremiah 5, look at verse 30. In Jeremiah 5, verse 30, he says, A wonderful and horrible thing has come to pass in the land, Sammy. He says, The prophets, they prophesy falsely. The priests by rule by their own means, and guess what? My people. Love the habit so. The people who had been entrusted with God's word, they were corrupt. The individuals who were supposed to have been pleading with the people to come back with God, they were corrupt. And then, Jeremiah 6, verse 16. If you go back to verse 14, the text says, they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Don't worry, as some people have you to say, don't worry, everything in America is great, the family is great, everything is great. Brothers and sisters, things are not great in the family. Now look at verse 16. This is God saying to Jeremiah, plead with my people. Beg them, Jeremiah. And as I read this text, I can see this young preacher, and he's pleading with these people to come back to God, to walk in the old path and in the old way. God doesn't want to destroy you. God doesn't want to put you in captivity. Please come back to God. God wants a relationship with you. I see this young boy pouring out his heart. 
But you know what the people said? We don't want to come back. We don't want to come back. We don't want a relationship with God. As I see America, I see a nation that is drifting farther and farther away from God. I see a nation that is forgetting about God. I see a nation that in 1964 stamped on her money and God we trust. I see a nation that is turning from God. And now what is going on in our nation is creeping into the families. And our families are turning from God. Because Israel refused to come back to God, God had to allow the Babylonians to come and destroy the city of Jerusalem. They're destroyed because of sin. Now go back to Lamentation chapter 1. The city of Jerusalem, God's city, this beautiful city of God, where the temple of God existed, of the presence of God with his people, is torn down. The gates are all flattered. And now the city is personified. And the city speaks to the people who are walking through her streets and says, is it nothing to you? Oh, you Jews that pass by and walk up and down, is it nothing to you people? When you see my destruction, you see the state that we're in, does it not grieve you that because of sin, God's city is destroyed? Is it nothing to you? I want to share with you the state of the American family. And what has caused me to spend my life preaching is that I saw this some 40-some years ago. And I started seeing the American family changing, and I wanted to be a part of being a solution. What can we do to help strengthen the family? So let me share some facts with you before I tell you what we can do to transform our homes, our houses, and the homes. In, ninth, in the 60s, 7% of children in America resided in a home with just one parent. And in the 60s, just 7% of homes in America just had one parent. Today, it is nearly 40%. In the 60s, in the 60s, 92% of individuals between the ages of 18 and 60 were married. Marriage was an institution that people couldn't wait to get in because it was such a wonderful experience. Today, only 47% and it's declining. In the 60s, 9% of marriages end by means of divorce. But today, it is over 53%. In the 60s, 7% of all babies that were born were born outside of marriage. Today, it is 52%. In 2017, more than half of the women murdered. Over half of the women murdered in 2017 were murdered by a husband, or a significant other. In the 60s, there were 5,000, 500,000 couples who reported to the censors that they were cohabitating or shacking up. In 2017, it's estimated as somewhere between 18 and 21 million people are cohabitating. One more. And I could go on and on with facts that are so disturbing. It makes you wonder, is it nothing to you? 
in 2017, a study was conducted by the Pew, by the Pew Research Center, a renowned research religious center. In 2017, of all the, re- of the estimate of all the religious people in America, 85% of them said they see nothing wrong with same-sex marriages. 85%. And on any given Sunday in America, less than 20% of people in America on a weekly basis attend church. But then one more thing, and I'll move on. The Pew Research Center also found this, that in America, 2017, that only 24% of people in America believe in the almighty God in heaven. The other 43% that believe in God don't believe he is the creator of the universe. Brothers and sisters, it's enough to make you cry. Brothers and sisters, we're, we're, we're in a nation that when you look at the facts, When you look at the facts when it comes to religion, I can go on and the behavior that goes on in the family when when family members are killing each other, when family members are bickering with each other and they don't care, it makes you wonder, God, what in the world is going on? What can we do? I've stopped by to share with you some good news. We've got some good news. God is still reigning on the throne. Amen? Amen. God is still reigning on the throne. And God, I believe some great years are ahead for this country. But we need to bring God back into our country. We need to have values. And the values that were instilled in me is my job to pass it on to my children and to my grandchildren. Because if I don't pass it on, then there's no telling what the world. Pass it on, please. So what can we do? Suggest five things. Five things that need to be in your family. And if these ingredients are there, you're going to see a house slowly being transformed into a home. And some of you remember because you grew up in a home. Amen? Amen. And you remember certain values. You remember certain things that were taught in your home and, and that was manifested in your home that have made you to be the people that you are. And that's why some of you have been in the church 30, 40, 60 years because you grew up in a home. Our children and grandchildren deserve a home. And if we're going to make the Lord's church stronger, we need more homes and less houses in America. The first ingredient, in order to transform a house and a home, we need homes that are loving. Did you hear what I just said? We need homes that are loving. Well, what's a loving home? A loving home is where family members put each other before self. Oh, you didn't hear what I just said. You see, a home is where a husband puts his wife before himself. It's not about me. It's about what can I do to make Diane feel that she is the queen of this house, of this home, rather. To love her, to love her with a sacrificial and and agape love for the children to know that they're loved and to have that kind of relation. Go to John chapter 21. Go to John chapter 21. Look at verse 15. Why is it before Jesus goes back to heaven He has to have this conversation with Peter. You see, you have to understand it. Peter had denied the Lord three times. But he had made Peter a promise. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. How in the world is Peter going to be the priest of first gospel sermon? And he denied the Lord three times. Jesus transformed him. He comes to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? This is after he denied the Lord three times. Peter, do you really love? Yeah, Lord, I told you, you know I love you, Lord. Why do you ask me that? He comes back the second time. Peter, do you really love me? Oh, yes, Lord, I I love you. No, Peter, will you put me before you 
Are you willing to die for me? You see, what makes a home, what makes a place of residence a home is when family members will die for one another. There are things I wouldn't do when I was home with my parents as a teenager. I didn't experiment with drugs. I didn't party hardy. You know why? Because I was a Christian. And I didn't want my parents to be embarrassed. I didn't, there are things I wanted to do, but there are things I didn't do because I love my parents and I love God. In 1979, I graduated from Freed Hardman University. Two months later, after graduating, I was teaching at a state university. A graduate assistant teaching a class. I was 21 years old. And I never forget the first class I taught. I had 255 students in the class. And within the first week, I had a young girl to come by my office. And she said, Mr. Jones, you're a great teacher. I, I like you. He said, I want an A in your class. And I'll do anything you want to get an A. Why didn't I sleep with that young girl? You know why? Because I loved my wife too much. But more than that, I love God too much. My Christian values wouldn't let me go there. When I had colleagues, they were sleeping with the students. But I didn't do that. And for every year and semester I taught there, I had four or five young girls proposition me. But I didn't go there. You know why? My love for God wouldn't let me go there. Since I've been preaching there, and I'll never forget, I was in Oklahoma City doing a meeting went out to a restaurant to eat, and a lady, I was eating by myself, and I can go on with numerous examples of this. And she said, do you want company? I'm so thankful to say in my 40-plus years of married life that I haven't been unfaithful. You know why? Because that's what love will cause you to do. It calls you to be faithful. I didn't want my boys to ever have to say, Daddy, how could you do that to Mama? I never hit my spouse. You know why? Love will cause you to control yourself. You see, that's what a home, but that's what I grew up in. And that's what we owe it, is to pass it on. Peter, do you love me? He finally got it. Yes, Lord, I love you. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 13. And 2 Peter chapter 1, as Peter's writing this epistle, knowing that in, in six to seven months he's going to be put to death, he tell this congregation to be steadfast, to make your calling and election sure. Because what the Lord told me 32 years ago is about to become reality. What did the Lord tell you? That one day is going to come, Peter. Some people are going to take you by the hand and take you to a place you don't want to go. Now the Roman soldiers are knocking at the door. Peter, are you going to deny him this time? No. You know why? He loved the Lord too much. You see, when you love someone, there are things you would do that people say, you're crazy. I'm just crazy for the Lord, and I'm crazy for dying. There are things I will not do as long as I'm in my right mind, because that's what love would do. Let's go to the second. You see, what transforms a house into a home is a willingness to make sacrifices. A willingness not only love beyond measure, but a willingness to make sacrifices that the world is not able to make. Go to Matthew 5. Look at verse 41. Listen to what Jesus says. In order to be one of his disciples, he's talking about the future of the kingdom, and he gives a statement that, that the Jews, they dislike. You see, the Romans had a law that if a soldier was carrying a bag, let's assume that bag was 20 pounds and they got tired. They can commission a Jew to carry it. And that Jew had to carry it. And you know what? One mile. You know, they would carry it, and, but they would be mad, griping the whole way. I'm carrying this man. I really hope this guy break a leg or whatever. <laughs> now, this is a Christ Jew, a Christ, I mean, a Jew that believed in God and wishing bad. You know why? They hated the, the Romans. Now, Jesus comes on the scene and says, Now, if you're going to be one of my disciples, if you're going to represent me, you can't be a one-mile Christian. you got to be a two-mile Christian. Did you hear what I just said? You're not to be like everybody else. 
I want you to carry the bag not only one mile, I want you to carry it two. How many of you think that people got up and left? This man is crazy. You see, Christians go the extra mile. You just don't love your wife like the world. You just don't love your children like the world. You love, you go the extra mile. That's why when I had boys in the house, teenagers in the house, I didn't hold gospel meetings in the summertime. You know why? Because I wanted to be in the stand so those boys would know that daddy is pulling for them. And people could understand why, Sammy. You're not doing gospel meeting because I didn't want my boys to grow up and say, and I, they despised the day I was born because daddy had time to go and preach there, do seminars there, but he was, never had time for us. I want to have that relationship with them that they can come and talk to me and that means you got to spend some time with them. And all those boys now have a great relationship with them. You know, you got to make some sacrifices. I'm not concerned about whether people know me. I just want the Lord to know me. I want my family to know me. I can go to heaven without preaching. I don't want to go to heaven without my boys, without my family. So it's important. Go to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, and we're going to go to number 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, Paul says, The love of Christ constraineth me, Sammy. Why did you, Paul, keep preaching? You ever thought about that? In the midst of being criticized, talked about in the church, out of the church, why did Paul keep preaching? He says, Sammy, it was easy for me to make the sacrifices because I love the Lord so much. When you really love someone, it's easy to make sacrifices. It's easy loving and making sacrifices for the Lord and for Diane and for our families. It's because we love each other. I quoted a poem on yesterday. I want to quote it now again. Entitled A Cold Within. Listen to it. Six humans were trapped by happenstance in bleak and bitter cold. Each one possessed a stick of wood or so the story is told. Their dying fire was in need of logs, but the first man held his back for the faces around the fire. He noticed that one was black. The next man, looking across the way, saw one not of his church. He couldn't bring himself to give the fire his stick of birch. The third one sat in tattered clothes. As it gave his coat a hitch, why should my law be put to use to warm the idle rich? Well, the rich man just sat back and thought of the wealth he had in store and how to keep what he had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man face bespoke revenge as a fire passed from his sight for all that he saw in his stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. The last man of this forlorn group did not accept for gain. Giving only to those who gave was how he played the game. So with their laws held tight and death still hand was proof of human sin. These six men did not die from the cold without. All six of them died from the cold within. You know what's killing some families? The cold within. The unwillingness of mom and dad, the children to make sacrifices for the family is killing our families. Number three, there must be a willingness to be introspective. Introspective means that each family member must look at himself and herself and say, what changes do I need to make that I can be a better husband? That's how you transform a house into a home. Not to point out that Diane, this is what you need to do. It's, Sammy, here's what you need to do. Not point out what the boys or the girls of your family need to do, but each person may say, I can be a better son. I can be a better daughter. I can be a better mother, a better father. But I got to make my family after the Lord a top priority. Shame on any man. This is Sammy talking. This is my perspective. Shame on any man if you can spend 60 hours a week being successful in your career, but you can't spend five hours a week with your children. Shame on you. Shame on you. And then we wonder why our children mess up. Where are we? I don't need anybody raising my boys or raising my family. That's my job. That's my job to teach them values. 
If they're not going to be, if they're going to be making a contribution to society, it's important that I do my job. But most of all, if they make it to heaven, it's not the elder's fault. If they don't make it, it's my fault. I need to take ownership. I encourage you to take ownership. And our home people take ownership for the family. We're missing that in America. We want to, it's everybody else's fault. No, it's my fault. It's our fault if our children don't make it to heaven. You see, introspective. You see, David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, great man, but he thought that since he was king, he can do what he wanted to until God told Nathan to, to challenge him to look at himself. Verse 7. You know the story how David talked, to, Nathan told him about a man that took another man's lamb and he ended that verse 7 saying, David, thou art the man. And when David looked at himself, he said, Nathan, pray for me. I've sinned. I put myself before God. I put myself before this. And it was at that point that David became a changed man. Years later, he's a dead man. And God said this about this man who was an adulterer, a murderer, a liar, and so forth. He was a man after my own heart. Why? It all started with him looking at himself. I challenge you to look at yourself. Is it nothing to you? Is your family not that important to you? Number four, be appreciative. When was the last time you said to your wife, babe, I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you. I thank God every day for you. When was the last time you said to your husband, thank you so much. I know a man that don't even come home. I know a man, thank you for being a good husband, a good father. Children, when the last time you said to mom and daddy, thank you. Thank you, mom. Thank you, dad. i never forget one of my favorite movies that ripped my heart out. As I was sitting on the couch watching this movie about a mother and a, and a daughter, and this mother loved this daughter so much, but this daughter was embarrassed of mom. And over a process of time, she broke mom's heart. But mom kept on loving this girl. And when mom died, here she comes. That's my mother. Let me through. Let me get through. All mother wanted was for her to appreciate her. If you've ever seen the movie Imitation of Life, you know what I'm talking about. Don't do that to your parents' children. Let your parents know how much you appreciate them. What is missing in our, in our homes is appreciation. We're taking for granted, that's your job to feed me. That's your job to put a roof. You give me a cell phone. No, you're not entitled to any of that. I plead with us to start appreciating our family. And finally, number five is to be forgiving. Be forgiving. Let it go. Let it go. It doesn't matter. Let it go. It doesn't matter what she said or what she did or what he did. Let it go. You know what's keeping a lot of houses from becoming homes is we can't let the past be the past. Let it go. Let it go. I am so thankful that I serve a God that's not going to bring up my past. I've got one. I got, I've done things I'm ashamed of. As I said on yesterday, I've said things that I'm ashamed of the people that I love, but I'm so thankful that they have forgiven me. I'm so thankful. Peter says these words in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Love will cover a multitude of sins. What kind of love? Sweet love. When you really love someone and you really care for your family, somehow you do everything you can to keep that family together. As I close, let me tell you about a, a man that loved, a man that loved his family. It's in Luke chapter 15. It's about a father who had two sons. One son said to his dad, Dad, I'm getting tired of you telling me what to do. I'm getting tired of you telling me who can be my friends. I, I'm leaving. I want to get out. But before I leave, I need some money. Wasn't entitled to anything, but the dad gave him a portion of his wealth. 
before he, the boy left, let me tell you about this daddy. Let me tell you what a house, what a home would do, rather. This dad went and I can see him now praying. Johnny's getting ready to leave that. And his name is Johnny, by the way. <laughs> God, please take care of Johnny. Johnny doesn't know that all I mean for him is the, is the best. God, please take care of Johnny. This dad is going to give this son this money, but he's sending him out saying, God, please care for him. Bring my boy back home. Johnny goes out. He wasted his inheritance. He just lives a rotten life. He didn't realize that he had a great dad. He had a great home. But all of a sudden, one day, he came to himself. And he said, I'm going home. And as he's walking home, he memorizes a speech. I'm going to tell my daddy, I'm sorry. He memorizing what he's going to say to his dad. But let's go back to the dad. I don't know how many years have transpired. Let's say it's 20 years. 25 years, and I can see that dad every day sitting on the porch saying, I wish Johnny would call. All right, I just want to see Johnny. God, please take care of my boy. I just wish I could see him just one more time. You see, that's what a home calls you to do. You're concerned about the members. And one day as he's sitting on the porch, he's got a manuscript he's probably been reading and he fell asleep, like most people do when they read the Bible. But when he wakes up, he sees in the distance there somebody coming over the hill. He knew that walk. It was Johnny. Let me tell you what that daddy didn't do. He didn't stand up and fold his arms and hope, Johnny, stop right there. 20 years ago, you gave me a piece of your mind. I'm going to give you a piece of mine. Get off my property. You're not welcome here. I gave you your inheritance. You just get on away from here. I don't want to see you. Get away from me. No, that's not the father. Let me tell you the father that you see in a home. Is that when he stood up, he said, that's my boy. That's my boy, Johnny. And I can see this man jumping off the porch, and he's running towards Johnny. Can't you see him? He's running. And his tears coming down his cheek. His boy's coming home. You haven't seen him in 20 years, and he's coming home. And all of a sudden, the arms open up. And when Johnny sees that, guess what? Johnny starts running. And here are two adult males running towards each other. And when they embrace, what a day. What a day. Johnny started sharing that speech that he had memorized. Dad, I got something to tell you. And Dad says, shh, Johnny, it doesn't matter, son. Johnny, I, I don't care what, you, what you've done. I don't care. I don't care. I'm just so glad you're home, boy. I love you. I love you, son. I'm just so glad you're home. You see, that's what a home would do. I don't care what you said. I'm just so glad you're here, boy. I love you. You once was blind, boy, but now you see Put a ring on his finger. Put shoes on his feet. Give him the fattest calf. You see, that's what's going to make the Lord's church strong again. That's what's going to make our society strong again. It's when we get back to building homes. As we close, the Lord wants a relationship with you. And the picture in that parable is God. And God doesn't care what you have done. He just wants you to come home just as you are, and he will cleanse you. Maybe there's someone here this morning as a husband. You know you have not given your family your best. I plead with you. Don't you be concerned about what people are going to say about you. Your family is important to you. Make a commitment today. I'm going to give my family the very best. They deserve better out of me. Instead of giving this 20, 60, 80 hours a week to be successful, I want to be a successful dad. I want to be a successful husband. I'm going to start telling that sweet wife that God has blessed me with that's been so understanding and patient and forgiving with me. Baby, I love you so much. I'm not going to, I'm going to seize the moment. I'm going to let her know. I'm going to let him know. I'm going to let the children know. Today is a day when I'm going to 
make a change for the glory of God. If you're here and you haven't obeyed the gospel, I plead with you to do so. Romans 6, 17, the Bible said, God be thanked that we all were a servant of sin. We were all once a slave to sin, but we have obeyed. You've obeyed from the heart a pattern. And when you obeyed that pattern, you were then made free from sin. What's the pattern? You died to sin. What's the pattern? You were buried in the watery grave of baptism. What's the pattern? You were resurrected to walk in the newness of life. When you did that, Jesus and God removed sin from your life. If you just remain faithful, there's a home prepared for you in heaven. God wants a relationship with you. I apologize for the longevity of the lesson, but I had something on my heart I want to share with you. But the Lord is calling you home right now. and He's talking to somebody's heart. I don't know who you are, but I know somebody needs to come to the Lord. And he'll forgive you. He'll make you. He'll help you to be the, what you know in your heart you want to be. The song of encouragement has been selected. Why don't you come as we together stand and sing. Make my life closer to you more.